Japan Station is made possible in part by Patreon support, and I'd like to say thank you to our newest patron, Christine Gilpin. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Christine. You just, thank you it, it, from the bottom of my heart, and also from the bottom of my heart, thank you to the already existing patrons who have been upping their pledges, Ignacio and Tom Culbertson. Um, thank you, seriously. Like, since we announced the YouTube channel, it's been amazing to see all the support. Uh, I, I, I'm so happy that you guys are enjoying it and that you guys want more of it. Um, we're giving it our all. So we're, we're doing our best not to disappoint you. And we really, really, really appreciate all the support. If you want to become a patron as well, then head on over to japankyo.com slash Patreon. You're going to get access to the podcast before the general public. And also you're going to get access to versions that don't have this long intro thing at the beginning. So <laughs> go check out japankyo.com slash Patreon if you want to help fund what we're doing here here and to everybody else well thank you thank you thank you welcome to japan station a production of japanko.com i'm your host tony vega if you haven't already, then please go subscribe to the new YouTube channel that we just started. It's called Japankyo Docs. We're releasing short documentaries about interesting people in Japan. The first one was about the creation of an anti-coronavirus uh, yuru kiara, like these kind of silly mascots that you see in Japan. Uh, the second video, which just came out about a, a week before the release of this episode, is about a Japanese YouTuber that uh, has an amazing pompadour and creates content about his pompadour and his fashion and he tells us all about well why he has the pompadour what he does you know and how he styles the hair like it's actually a really really interesting process he takes us through the whole thing it might sound a little weird but trust me i think it's a really good video i mean kyle uh from Tokyo explosion podcast we're working on this together um he, he did an amazing job with the editing so please 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 go check it out there is a link in the show notes but you can also just go to japankyo.com slash yt hit that subscribe button hit the like button hit up the comment section do whatever you can so that youtube realizes that this is content that people enjoy and so that it can help spread it to other people because uh well we we do need to grow the channel in order to keep doing it and and make it financially viable you know this is kind of a costly endeavor uh but with your help we can make it happen so again japankyo docs you can go to japankyo.com slash yt all right, so my guest today is Dr. Robert Hellyer. He is an associate professor of history at Wake Forest University. He's a specialist in uh, early modern and modern history of Japan. And he has a new book out that just came out very recently. It's called Green with Milk and Sugar, When Japan Filled America's Teacups. So as you can probably figure out from the title, it is about tea, specifically uh, green tea and the interesting relationship that uh, existed between Japan and the U.S. Uh, as it pertains to green tea. Uh, I think a lot of people just assume that green tea was this thing that burst into popularity in the past, I don't know, maybe like 20, 30 years, maybe in the late 90s or 2000s. But in reality, there is actually a really long history. Like people were drinking green tea here in the U.S. Uh, a very long time ago. And, and the book goes into that and the whole tea trade and tea marketing back in like the 19th century, 1800s, 1900s. Um, it, it's a really interesting book. If you want to check it out, there is a link in the show notes. And uh, of course, you can also just look it up wherever you get your books. Um, I enjoyed it. And uh, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Robert Hellier. The next stop is Japan Station. The doors on the right side will open. Let's start with, with the term green tea. Um, because there's not just one green tea in Japan, right? Like in, in English, it gets all kind of clumped together. But in Japan, you have like different names. Like you have matcha, of course, you have ryokucha. Like when, when you're talking about green tea in, in, in the book, what, what kind of green tea are you mainly focusing on? Sure. And I guess that to answer that first, maybe I should explain that there are generally three main groupings of tea based mm -hmm. on the oxidization. So green tea is oxidized the least. Then oolong mm -hmm. 
tea is oxidized a bit more, followed then by black tea. Mm. So within the green tea, uh, the main types that we have in Japan today are sencha, which is the highest grade of green tea uh, and is usually picked from some of the better leaves. And then also there's bancha, uh, mm -hmm. which is many times picked, or I should say composed of tea leaves that are picked later in the season, a lot more stems. Mm. Um, and many times bancha does have a brown color when brewed, but it mm. is officially a green tea because it has been oxidized less than other types of tea. Mm. And then, of course, matcha, uh, I should have said it that first because it is the top of the line tea, if you will. Um, but the, it's even better uh, tea leaves than what are used to make sencha. And those leaves are then ground into a powder. And mm. uh, matcha is, is used uh, primarily, well, probably is most well known uh, for its use in the tea ceremony. Right, right. And I think matcha is, is the one that I, I guess you could say it's it's the rather trendy one in, in the U.S. And, and in some other countries as well, right? Because that, that's kind of the one that you hear about outside of Japan, at least these yes. days. Uh, yes, in, in recent years, uh, matcha has been seen uh, for its health uh, values or health uh, attributes. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, that there are some people that sprinkle matcha on top of other foods uh, to add mm. a, a boost of antioxidants or other mm. uh, ideas of making their foods healthier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but in, in Japan, it's like when, when you go, it's like you, you get tea all the time. It's like, I don't know, there's so many different kinds of teas. It's, <laughs> right, it's not right. just matcha. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. And so those are the matcha, if you have matcha, sencha, and bancha would be three of the main varieties. And of course, there's, there's a lot more yeah. Uh, between the uh, uh, other varieties that that are from those main varieties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I this is this is certainly a, a small tangent here, but I, I had the opportunity to interview a, a person from Itoen, the the tea mm -hmm. company, one time, and he was like this tea expert, right? He was like a certified tea expert. They have this crazy like exam that that they have to like taste test a whole bunch of stuff, and he was like, you know, really. I guess one of the top class guys and he was complaining about how kombucha which in Japan is different from what people know what kombucha is in, in the US right but right kombucha has the cha at the end but he was complaining it's not cha because it doesn't come from the cha tea leaf it should be called kombu jiru jiru <laughs> shiru comes from like super like <laughs> liquid he was complaining about that <laughs> Yes, I think there's another uh, neat research project for somebody to look into about how yeah. Americans came up with this idea of, of their particular kombucha, which is quite yeah. popular in the United States today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like different. Yeah, it's a whole, uh, it's like a rabbit hole. It's like two different things, the kombucha <laughs> over there and the kombucha over here. But anyway, sorry, that was just a funny thing that I remembered. Um, all right, so... Something that I, I, I really found really interesting about the book is, you know, of course, the history in general is, is very interesting, but you have this personal family connection that goes back in a way, I guess you could even say like kind of back to the Edo period um, with like the tea trade. And so I, I was wondering, could, could you tell us a bit about that family connection? Because I, I loved learning about that aspect. It had this kind of like two sided thing, like just yes, general tea, but also like, oh, look, the author has this weird connection. Like, how did this happen? <laughs> oh, well, thanks very much for asking yeah. about that. Yes, it was one of the reasons that propelled me to begin researching this topic. And my uh, uncle, five generations back, his name was William Alt, mm -hmm. uh, was the first to go to Japan. He uh, went to Nagasaki in late 1859, and that mm. was the year of which the treaty port regime was instituted in Japan. So the mm. first time that foreigners other than the Dutch and the Chinese were allowed to uh, trade in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, and he had left Britain uh, about 13, I uh, should say, uh, in 1853. Um, and he worked on a merchant ship, and he got to see about how tea was traded by going to Shanghai. Mm. And he... You know, he's in his early 20s and decided to look for better opportunities and developed a, a firm in Nagasaki that was involved in a, a number of things, including exporting green tea. Mm -hmm. um, and he was very successful in this and his other enterprises. And so by 
the age of his early 30s, uh, I think around 32, he was able to do what many of us probably have a dream to retire just after 30 um, wow. and be able to uh, buy a house. Uh, he was from Britain, uh, buy mm. a house outside of London, also later a villa in Italy. So he did very well. Um, and after he returned to Britain, he uh, entrusted the company to my great, great grandfather. His name was Frederick Hellyer, mm. who later changed the company name to Hellyer and Company mm. uh, and was involved continuing to export tea from Japan. Uh, and Frederick, he was also born in Britain, um, mm -hmm. but later decided to move the office and his family to Chicago in 1888. Mm. Uh, and this is because the Midwest was emerging as the main market for Japanese green tea. And therefore, it's I can conclude and say that my family, certainly my father's side, is American uh, mm -hmm. because of the fact that Americans liked Japanese green tea. Mm. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, so th then, how? Because I, William Alt, like I remember in the book, you, you mentioned you know he was in Japan for a long time. So at, at what point did the family leave Japan? Stop, stop going to Japan, and and like. I guess was it like the war? Like what? How did that transition happen? Oh yes. Well, the 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 company Hellyer and Company mm -hmm. uh, when Frederick was running it, it was based in Kobe, mm -hmm. and then later um, in the early twentieth century, moved its headquarters to Shizuoka uh, mm -hmm. because Shizuoka, as it is today, uh, was the main at, at that time. It became the main export hub and production hub for Japanese tea. Mm -hmm. uh, so therefore, the family lived in Shizuoka. Uh, until this, just before the start of World War II, oh, okay. and um, the f some uh, members of the family were still involved with the company after World War II, but it was eventually mm -hmm. sold. Uh, and the Tanimoto family um, mm -hmm. in the 1970s bought it and still run it under the name of Hellyer and Company in Shizuoka today. Oh, that's cool. I mean, <laughs> that's a ni it's nice to know the name still there at least. Uh yes, huh. yes. Oh, and cool. the Tanimotos have been very, very wonderfully supportive of me in this project. So if they're listening, uh, thanks to them. <laughs> oh, that's that's really cool. That's, that, I, I guess it's just katakana like Heria and the company or something like. Ah, uh, Heria Shokai. Yes. Heria Shokai. Yes, okay, yes. Okay. Okay. So oh, that's cool. Um, in, you said uh, Frederick was the company was based in in Kobe. Was that in the do you know, like, where in Kobe? Because like, th there was an area that was well-known for having, like, the foreigners live in that area. I'm just curious if, if that was the Ijinkan area. Uh, uh, yes, they, they would have lived in, and the factory would have been in the, the foreign concession in Kobe. Oh, um, I'm not quite sure where, where their houses were, but there mm -hmm. were a few years ago um, some of the foundation of the mm -hmm. Hellier & Company factory that was discovered um, when they were putting in a new building in, cool. in Kobe. Oh wow! Okay, yeah, I I lived in Kobe for a while. That's why oh, I caught okay. my attention. Okay, yeah. um, okay. So then, at at what point did you become aware of this family connection to Japan and tea? Like, is that something you heard about as a child or later on? Like, wh where did this interest in Japan come from? Is that connected? Uh, yes. Well, I grew up um, spending a lot of time with both my grandmothers who lived very mm -hmm. close by. Uh, and my paternal grandmother, uh, right after she was from the Chicago area, right after she married my, my grandfather, uh, they moved to Shizuoka in the early 1930s. Oh, and wow. so she would have a lot of great memories about her time in Shizuoka. It was only about f four or five years. Mm. Um, but she'd often relate to experiences about that. So I remembered um, those stories, and they mm. were in some ways the start of what I looked to into my research. Mm. Um, but also my maternal grandmother uh, had an influence in this project because she was also from the state of Illinois, but mm -hmm. she grew up in a rural town. Um, and I remember well that uh, she would often serve me uh, black tea or, or coffee, um, but she had a, a special stash of green tea that she mm. kept only for guests. Um, ah. <laughs> I, I was uh, not, I was too, <laughs> her grandson was, was yeah. not worth um giving this this uh, green tea to but exactly. uh, what what struck me was that that she grew up um in rural illinois um she was born in 1901 uh consuming green tea and she still kept 
uh, later in life that idea that green tea was more sophisticated mm. than other types of tea. And I always remembered that. And this was also then something that led me to look into this project and also uh, particularly focus on, on the Midwest, which became the center um, of consumption of Japanese green tea in the first part of the 20th century. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the you know main things in the book, uh, I, I guess, especially like, I mean, how, how can I put it? I, I like tea. I drink tea. Um, but I, I never really thought about it in, in the way that it's presented in the book, right? Like you always just kind of assume that in the U.S., you know, uh, green tea was something that, that became popular, I, I don't know, maybe like in the 90s or 2000s. But mm -hmm. there's actually a long history of, of like this connection between Japan and the U.S. and, and people consuming green tea in the U.S. as well, right? Uh, yes. Uh, going back to, oh, back to the story of William Alt in mm -hmm. 1860, uh, he and other British merchants and some American merchants who were in Nagasaki at the time mm -hmm. identified the U.S. market as being the appropriate place to start to exporting Japanese tea because uh, Japan was producing a high-quality green tea, and they knew that the American market, um, since around 1800, Americans had preferred a green teas over black teas. Mm -hmm. So, and up until then, I guess, was it China? Like, what, where was the green tea coming from? Uh, yes, up until uh, 1860, China was held a monopoly supplying the Western world with tea. Mm -hmm. So, in world history, in the world tea history, um, Japan's entry into the world tea market, export market in 1860 is an important uh, event because about a decade later, then we have India and Ceylon. Mm -hmm. also entering into the world market and exporting a lot of black teas. Mm -hmm. All right. So then when, when you started doing the research for this, like where do you start with this? Did you start like with, with your family members trying to like track down like family records or, or like how, how do you go about this? Because it, it's, it's a pretty big endeavor and I'm just curious like what angle you took. Oh, sure. Um, yes, that was uh, talking to family, getting any records that were mm -hmm. uh, held by the family was a great resource and mm -hmm. many times gave me a start in directions that I might uh, think of. Mm -hmm. uh, I was fortunate to get a couple fellowships uh, when mm -hmm. I started this project, one that was at the National Museum of American History. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I knew that they had a lot of advertisements, mm -hmm. uh, and a, great, a great collection of advertisements that was collected over the course of the late 19th and early 20th century. So I, I estimated, and I was right, that I could get a lot of information there, and I did. Um, also, then I was fortunate to get a f uh, fellowship from the Japan Foundation that allowed mm. me to spend a year in Japan. Mm. And uh, I was based at the University of Tokyo and using the libraries there, I found a lot of sources that were written by the Japanese uh, Tea Association, mm -hmm. um, which mm -hmm. was wonderfully recording a lot of the details about from anything from how much tea was being exported to also some really fantastic records of the American market where they would go and try and figure out why Americans were drinking the teas they were drinking. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And so sources like that are, are, are just gold for the yeah. researcher. Uh, that and also using a lot of newspaper accounts, both in, in Japanese and in English, um, yeah, helped I, me to understand the story of this tea trade. Yeah, I, I, had, I mean, I, maybe this is touches on, on you, you were talking about advertisements just now, but um, I, I loved the descriptions of some of the, they were like, what were they like, almost like trading cards, right? Like, the, the, at some point, maybe like early 1900s, late 1800s, where they were like kind of advertisements, but also kind of like collectible trading cards, and they, they had like artwork on them, and they were like advertising tea and various things, right? Like, uh, could you tell us a little bit about some of the advertisements and things that people were, were saying about tea at the time? Oh, sure. Yes, that yeah. was also something that was really exciting for me and, mm -hmm. and realized that I had the assumption that, you know, for example, advertisements had been in a newspapers or magazines going well back into the 19th century. But in mm -hmm. fact, in the early 19th century, a lot of advertisements were... And this is in the U.S., correct? In the U.S., it started yeah. in Britain, but mm -hmm. in the U.S., oh, okay. a lot of advertisements were, just you outlined, a trade card. Um, and these were many times printed in mass with pictures on one side mm -hmm. that many times would urge people to collect them. Mm. Um, and on the opposite side was the chance for, a, for example, a, a tea seller to stamp 
their information mm-hmm. um, on that, uh, maybe something about the types of teas they were selling, mm-hmm. and distribute them. For example, when a customer would buy a packet of tea, give them with them, but also uh, in other forms. So this was the earlier form of advertising. And then in the late 19th century, there started to become more uh, advertisements in magazines and newspapers. Mm-hmm. And part of the story that uh, was intriguing to me was seeing about how Japanese green tea, uh, the Japan Merchant Association that was involved in selling Japanese green tea in the United States, uh, was using advertisements uh, to try and challenge what was a move of also using advertisements from the Indian Ceylon lobby Mm -hmm. uh, that was looking to change American taste and sell more of their black teas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Something that I found interesting was like, you know, the involvement in like the world fairs and like sending like (laughs) the Japanese government sending like officials. And um, I'm not sure if, if, officially that the the women that they sent were geisha or just japanese women dressed to appear like geisha or michael um but they they would send these delegations to promote japanese tea right like what is that early 1900s late 1800s uh yes it's starting Mm -hmm. in the late 19th century and into the 20th century Mm -hmm. uh and there were really two aims of what japan was trying to do related to tea at the world's fairs first to present in a good light Japanese culture Mm -hmm. um, and have people come and learn about Japanese culture. So there would be displays of the tea ceremony, uh, many times with women that were in kimono, as you say, Mm -hmm. that were Mm -hmm. uh, brewing the tea and Mm -hmm. then at times offering samples for people. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing. But there was also uh, perhaps even more important for promoting and hopefully expanding the market for Japanese green tea in the U.S. was to have tea rooms um, where things like sencha would be sold, uh, packets would be sold for a lower price, packets of sencha. And at some of the uh, fairs, for example, in uh, Chicago in 1893, a real attempt to try and get Americans to open their wallets and buy more matcha. Mm-hmm. Um, it never really worked very effectively. <laughs> um, but w- it was also interesting in the research, and this is where I found in a lot of the newspaper articles mm-hmm. um, and some of the records on the Japanese side uh, about, y- you mentioned, were they geisha that these mm-hmm. women were representing? Um, there was a, a very much an effort to say that the women who were representing Japan were from uh, good families, as they often mm-hmm. said, that these mm-hmm. were not... Uh, working women, the right. idea that these would be prostitutes that ja- the Japanese just sent over, that there might be some kind of illicit connection to this tea house. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were very clear that that was not the case, that this was above the board, um, and this was a representation of Japanese culture that they wanted to present and not be seeing as, as a, uh, in this problematic way. Mm. So was the kind of, how can I put it, strategy on the part of the Japanese uh, officials or the Japanese side to try to sell Japanese tea as something that is better quality than the competition, like, for example, from China or like something more premium? Uh, Well, to answer that, it depends upon the the period of which Mm -hmm. we're talking about. Mm. Uh, Right after Japan started to export tea, uh, starting from 1860 until really into the 1880s, mm-hmm. uh, Japan was exporting a lot of what I call Chinese-style Japanese tea. Mm. This was because the Japanese uh, working in the tea factories and also the foreigners like William Alt had no idea about how to process and pack tea for export on an industrial scale. Mm. So they turned to Chinese experts who were a big part of these factories, the skilled Mm -hmm. staff of the factories. And the Chinese then directed that the tea would be produced in the same fashion that was being done uh, at China, uh, sorry, in China, um, going back um, from the the middle of the 18th century. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. this was the type of tea that was mainly exported 
um, at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, as you get more mechanization, then we're starting to see more of what we can think of today of Sencha as being exported. Mm -hmm. um, simply, and not to get too much into the weeds here about this, but that Chinese-style Japanese green tea um, was something that needed to be processed, uh, what it was called fired, Mm -hmm. uh, and it was put under intense heat for upwards of 30 or 40 minutes mm. to remove any kind of moisture. Um, and so with that tea, there was less of the natural green color. When you have better oh. mechanization, you can preserve the natural green color. So that's the type of tea, it, the differences there um, mm -hmm. over time of what's being exported. Mm. So when that transitions happens to not so we had the chinese style japanese green tea but then we transition into japanese style japanese tea <laughs> right right okay and then um, that's that's when they perhaps start emphasizing more the kind of more premium aspect of it uh yes they're they're okay. trying to emphasize the more premium aspect um mm -hmm. of their tea uh, mm -hmm. As I mentioned, for example, at the 1893 Chicago Fair, mm -hmm. um, they're also, uh, and I've noticed at another World's Fair, this was in Omaha, mm -hmm. trying to convince Americans to not put milk and sugar into the tea. They're really hoping. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is also something where I put myself a bit into the shoes of the Japanese at this uh, at this World Fair trying to promote their tea. They know they have a great product. It's delicious mm -hmm serve straight without any milk yeah. and sugar <laughs> and they want people to consume it that way so they at this fair they didn't have milk or sugar they kept it uh, uh, away <laughs> and this. people had to ask for it to add to it <laughs> they're trying to say please just try it our way first and i thought this was a bit of a gamble because yeah. right the the americans have the tea the way they like it many yeah. americans like to add don't milk tell and an sugar american to what to do <laughs> right right exactly <laughs> Um, and so it was always there's this balancing act of what they're what they're planning to do, both to meet the American particular desires for the tea, and then also um, the goal, understandably, to sell this premium product. Right, right, right. Oh, I love that. I can only imagine like the people's <laughs> like these Americans they're ruining the tea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but I mean, the the title of your book, I mean, the, the green with milk and sugar, right? I mean, that, that that's exactly what we're talking about, but. Um, that that comes from your your grandmother used to serve the tea like that, right? Is that is that where it comes from? Uh, part of it, but mm -hmm. actually, that's one of the things I want to emphasize is that I found uh, in looking at American tea culture starting in the early nineteenth century mm -hmm. that there was no particular American way of drinking tea. Mm -hmm. That you didn't need to have it straight, um, or you didn't need to always or expected to add milk and sugar to it. Mm -hmm. And so I was really struck by this uh, variety of how Americans would drink green tea, including mm -hmm. adding a lot of, of milk and sugar to it. So mm -hmm. that's that's where I came on to the title as representing then. Um, and I hope, too, one thing that can be a takeaway from the book is about how America has had its own pretty distinct tea culture uh, mm -hmm. since – the time of independence. Yes, it's been influenced a lot by Britain, but there are important uh, particular American ways of which tea has been consumed. And yeah. I, I hope that that will be uh, of interest. And those who hopefully can perhaps interested in buying the book, uh, mm -hmm. one thing that can be a takeaway from it. Um, if I remember correctly, I, I think uh, there is some evidence that there was some green tea thrown into the harbor at the Boston Tea Party as well, right? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, some historians have found that there's a, a small amount of green tea because <laughs> during colonial times, uh, uh -huh. Americans were drinking black teas and green teas alike, although uh, I think there was more black tea being consumed in the colonial period, and I think yeah. there was more thrown into Boston Harbor sure. uh, on that <laughs> fateful night in 1773. <laughs> still, still interesting to know. I was like, oh, they're, they're... You know, they, that, it's not, uh, like I said, it's not simply a modern thing. You know, there is some connection there all the way back to that those times. Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, yeah, another interesting thing in, in the book is your descriptions of, like, American tea parties and, you know, like, back in the 1800s and just these things that you 
you don't really think about, right? You, you think tea party, you think Alice in Wonderland, uh, you think afternoon tea in, in England and little girls uh, right. doing a little tea party. But there were like adult, like, you know, men and women having tea parties, right? Yes. Uh, well, one of the things, for example, is the idea of tea as a defined meal uh, mm -hmm. that you would have at a restaurant. Uh, I found this on many hotel menus, uh, say around five or so in the evening, of which mm -hmm. you would take tea, but uh, also be eating a meal. And as you said, uh, parties that were, uh, for example, some parties that I found that were organized uh, in the 1820s in mm -hmm. parts of Massachusetts, and then later on, uh, parties that continued into uh, throughout the 19th century, uh, mm -hmm. where, for example, some Americans would want to include what they thought were Japanese uh, additions to a tea party, uh, maybe a few screens that they had purchased. Um, <laughs> that is, oh my God. <laughs> uh, these things. And uh, to the frustration of the, the researcher, the historian, uh, these descriptions would never say, well, were they were they consuming green tea? That's what I wanted to know. But they, would, they wouldn't always say this, but but they were very keen. Enough Many with of the them screens. Keen. I want to know about yes, the tea. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, um, very much about what... Uh, they, they had a certain style, right, that uh -huh. wasn't um, defined um, yeah. by a particular um, group or anything. So I guess it, it underscores, again, that sense of American tea culture, that how expansive it was and how it was defined by individual tastes. Yeah, yeah. That's so interesting. Like, because, again, you know, we go, come back to modern times and we think, like, Japan was this thing that became kind of trendy, I, I don't know, maybe in the 90s or 2000s. You know, you have this whole cool Japan thing and pop culture and fashion. But even, what, what is that? Like, are we talking like 100 years ago? Like, there, there were these time periods when Japan was trendy in its own way, like, among certain crowds, right? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Particularly from the, the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of first from elites. Uh, yeah. into Japanese art and Japanese culture. Yeah. Um, but then also that in the United States in the late 19th century, there were many Japanese novelty stores um, that included a collection of goods that not uh, a small portion were probably made in Japan, but a lot <laughs> of them were made from other parts of East Asia or other parts of the world, maybe yeah. in the U.S. as well. Yeah. Um, but there were places where people could go and buy things like these screens or other novelties Mm -hmm. uh, that they would put in their home or perhaps have uh, when they would hold a tea party. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one one interesting um, thing that we go like that you go into the book is we've we've kind of talked about it a little bit, but you know these changing trends, right? We have you know the Chinese tea, then we have the Japanese tea coming in, and and you know it kind of wanes and and rises in popularity. Each one, you know, they're kind of competing with each other, but these one factor that is at play are these feelings of um, xenophobia, racism, you know, tensions between countries. Um, I mean, that's a huge topic, but could, could you give us a little bit of, of context just to get a general idea of some of the factors at play, like throughout the history of tea and, and its popularity here in the U.S.? Sure. Um, again, to talk about different periods mm -hmm. of when Japanese tea is introduced in the 1860s and particularly the 1870s, uh, Japanese tea takes advantage of the growing anti-Chinese sentiment mm -hmm. in the United States at the time. Uh, and I was struck by what I found on advertisements comparing both the, those for Japanese tea and those for Chinese tea, how Chinese were represented in a very uh, deprecating fashion. Mm -hmm. um, the Chinese were mocked both for mm -hmm. their use of English um, and as being uh, unsophisticated, where mm -hmm. the Japanese that are in these illustrations are presented in a much more generous yeah. uh, manner. And also, uh, people that were talking about tea in that period would say that you can trust Chinese, excuse me, you can trust Japanese tea mm -hmm. as being a pure product. Well, you have to worry about adulterations that are in Chinese tea. Mm -hmm. So this was one factor that helped Japanese green tea gain a market share in the United States because, as I mentioned earlier, that, you know, it was all Chinese tea in the U.S. until mm -hmm. uh, 1860. Uh, and next period then is starting in the 1890s when you have the Indian Ceylon lobby come and bring in advertisements which are very racially charged, which are also attacking mm -hmm. uh, both 
not only Chinese tea, but Japanese green tea and green tea in general as being dangerous, uh, dirty, and fraudulent. Mm. Um, and many, I have an image in the book of what was often described as the dirty coolie, mm -hmm. uh, who, was, who was portrayed as producing Japanese or Chinese green tea uh, in a hot factory, and invariably his sweat would get into the tea and create the particular flavor mm -hmm. as it was portrayed in these advertisements. At the same time, advertisements that said that you should buy India or Ceylon tea because it's white supervised. Yes, it's made by Indians or people in, in Ceylon, mm. um, but it's under this white supervision so you can trust it more. Um, the racism is, is certainly clear in both cases. Um, and the particularly the attacks on green tea that started in the 1890s, uh, I believe, are setting up uh, one of the reasons then why in the 1920s, Americans began to turn to black teas, uh, mm -hmm. starting a trend that really continues to today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, and then eventually we get into the whole anti-Japanese sentiment and then, you know, that 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 <laughs> that takes a while, <laughs> I guess. But yeah. Um, uh, sure. I mean, well, one mm -hmm. thing that was also... Um, surprising to me mm -hmm. that that I didn't find particularly safe, for example, on the West Coast where you had this awful uh, anti-Japanese sentiment, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the racism against Japanese. And in the literature that I read from these groups, uh, they were attacking Japanese who were in the United States as being a threat to white labor, um, mm -hmm. but not necessarily against Japanese tea. And I think the point was that the tea was not being produced in America, so therefore this was not as big of an issue for them. Um, so yes, that that was one thing that was, um, you know, another thing that was striking in yeah. in doing this research. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Um, I, I mean, uh, you you've just said now like one thing that was you know kind of striking about the research and and. Maybe you, you've, I'm sure you've kind of brought up a couple other things throughout the conversation, but is, is there anything that particularly surprised you that you weren't expecting that you didn't know about, you know, tea and the whole history um, that you learned while doing the research of the book? Anything else you could share with us? Sure. I mean, there's, that's one of the great things about doing a research project like this is you, <laughs> you learn so much and it's so yeah. exciting. Um, maybe I could mention one of the things that mm -hmm. about uh, tea in Japan. Mm -hmm. that I was surprised about. I, I started this project thinking that Sencha, which was created in the 18th century, had there, after that point, been widely consumed in Japan, being the dominant tea. And, and mm -hmm. uh, my assumption was, why not buy the better tea, right? Why not consume that? Mm -hmm. So I was very surprised to find that, yes, Sencha was consumed um, throughout Japan starting in the 18th century, mm -hmm. But also the fact of how important Bancha was. Mm. Uh, Bancha, because number one, that so many Japanese were living in rural areas on farms and growing their own food, and therefore many times between rice paddies, growing their tea and harvesting the tea, the Bancha, in the way particularly of has been done in the region. Mm -hmm. And so that was one reason why bancha was prevalent, but also I was quite surprised in reading a report about tea in Japan, actually a report about tea in Tokyo in the 1920s, about how many elite families were choosing bancha because they said it, it was healthier than mm. sencha. Mm -hmm. um, this could be akin to perhaps uh, you know brown rice being healthier than white rice or brown bread, right, uh, as mm -hmm. being healthier than, than right. white bread in those ways. And so, therefore, how the Japan uh, Tea Merchant Association that had seen their exports to the American market decline markedly in the 1920s as Americans began to consume Indian Ceylon black teas started to mount advertising campaigns where they were wanting to encourage Japanese to drink sencha because mm -hmm. here they had a glut of the sencha that was mm -hmm. up to this point had been exported to the mm -hmm. United States. Mm -hmm. So in that way, thinking about how a change on the American market influenced tea in Japan um, was a really surprising conclusion for me. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, 
the uh, I know your book doesn't necessarily focus on consumption and what the most delicious tea is and that kind of thing. But I assume you've tasted a lot of teas and and you you have that experience. Do you have any kind of recommendations? Anything that you particularly enjoy that you could share with us? Oh well, I I really enjoy all types of tea. Um, uh, a Japanese green tea, particularly one that's uh, mm-hmm. the first of the season uh, when it's brewed, the aroma is is so wonderful and the flavor is is very special. Um, I do like bancha as mm-hmm. well. Um, oolong tea, it's not produced as much in Japan, but the oolong from Taiwan is also one of the most aromatic and and wonderfully flavorful teas. Mm-hmm. Um, and black teas um, from places like India or, or, or Sri Lanka today, mm-hmm. uh, but also lately a lot from Kenya, uh, I think also have a very nice flavor. And I, I like those with milk and sugar. Mm, um, I was just about teas. to ask you, do you still drink, <laughs> so, do you drink tea with milk and sugar? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, I, I do. I do like that. So I'm, uh-huh. um, I'm, I appreciate all types of sure, teas. Sure. And I've appreciated it even more um, after doing this project, particularly thinking about, uh, for example, researching about the women who worked in the factories Mm. in in Yokohama in mm-hmm. the late 19th century the long hours they put in in refining the teas i i often think about the people behind uh yeah. the production in a way that uh i realized i was neglectful in the past yeah 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 there's so many stages right from you know the the farmer all the way up to the store where it's finally right. sold and there's so right. many people in between there yeah um Wonderful. So, um, where where can people get the book? I mean, I, I guess it's available anywhere where people can get books. Absolutely, yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, if they search on Google or another search engine uh, mm-hmm. by the title, I think it'll mm-hmm. take you to the Columbia University Press yeah. uh, website. And if you get that, go to that website, and the discount code of CUP twenty uh, will give you a discount. So, nice. I, I hope. Uh, people will be interested in the book. Uh, yeah, and definitely. Thank there, you, there's thank you so for... much more that we didn't get to talk about. And we only did like kind of a surface level here to some of the topics. But it, it's a very interesting approach to tea. Like tea, tea is one of these topics that I've been wanting to talk about. But I, I was never sure like how to approach it. Because it's like, can I do 40 minutes about like, what's the delicious tea? I mean, maybe I can. I don't know. But I, I love this kind of historical angle to it. And like I said, your family connections. I, I enjoyed reading the book. Well, thank you very much for reading it, and thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. It's it's really been a pleasure. Again, Green with Milk and Sugar is the name of the book. And if you want to find a link, well, go check out the show notes uh, in your podcast app, or you can go to japanstationpodcast.com. If you have any questions or comments, send them over to mail at japanstationpodcast.com. Please remember to follow on Facebook and Twitter and now Instagram at Japankyo News. Don't forget to subscribe as well to the show. That is the number one free thing you can do to support the show. That helps boost the rankings in a lot of these platforms. So you're helping out the show. It doesn't cost you anything extra. And if you're extra generous, and I certainly would appreciate it, you can leave a review and a rating on whatever podcast platform you use. As always, thank you so much to Yunomi for providing the opening and closing song, Oedo Controller, information in the show notes. That does it for this episode. The next episode should be out on schedule on December 1st. If you haven't already listened to the latest episode of Ichimon Japan, please go do that. It's a really fun one. It's all about, well, (laughs) the history of school uniforms in Japan and the controversy surrounding bloomers. So... uh, Maybe you know what bloomers are. They're budama in in Japanese. Uh, They're those kind of like short shorts that girls used to wear. They're rather controversial for kind of obvious reasons uh, because they're short shorts and they're no need for them to be short shorts uh but anyway there's a really interesting story to to the whole budama thing so if you want to learn about that go check out the latest episode of ichimon japan link in the show notes thank you so much for listening and remember go find your miniature pony just do it